Hi, everyone, and welcome to Unorthodox Reality versus Fiction. I'm Jody Rujoran. I'm the editor in chief of The Forward, and I'm here in my basement in Montclair, New Jersey. I've got this amazing, amazing panel um, here with me today, and we've got tons of people signed up for this conversation. We're so excited to all. Um, we actually had almost twice the capacity of people signed up that Zoom can handle, so we're broadcasting as well live on Facebook, on the um, Facebook page of The Forward. Uh, so if you have friends who are texting you madly saying, I can't get in, I can't get in, please direct them to our Facebook page. Um, and I'm gonna start by um, introducing very briefly the panelists, and then we'll just start the conversation. We're gonna have plenty of time for your questions and comments, um, and let's get on with it. So we've got one of the creators of the show with us, Alexa Karolinski, who's in her home in Los Angeles. She splits her time between Berlin and LA. She was born in Germany, um, has a perfect English you'll hear because she has a Canadian parent, um, and has a background in documentary before working on this uh, series, which will be really interesting to talk about. Um, also from the show Unorthodox, we have Ellie Rosen, um, who not only is an actor in the show, but also was a consultant on its use of Yiddish. He is a former member of the Hasidic community and left when he was 32. So he also has personal experience with the narrative that um, we followed SD through. Uh, we also, ha also have with us Javi Weisberger of the organization Footsteps based in New York. She's in her home in Brooklyn. Great painting by her daughter behind her. Um, and Javi's, Javi's organization Footsteps is the leading organization that helps people um, transition from the Hasidic community out um, and really has the sort of real world on the ground experience, personal as well as professional to share with us. We also have with us Rabbi Abby Stein, who herself um, left the Hasidic community and I believe is the first Orthodox, the first women with Orthodox smicha in a complicated way that we'll hear more about. <laughs> And we also have with us Rachel Schachter, um, our wonderful uh, Yiddish editor of The Forward, the first female uh, Yiddish editor of The Forward. And uh, Rachel is the, one of the key leaders across the community of Yiddish culture and language. She's actually about to start a daily um, YouTube show um, teaching a Yiddish word or phrase of the day, so more about that later. Um, we have more than a thousand people signed on. We're thrilled. That is apparently Zoom's capacity. So congratulations everybody for um, making it. I know among them are my mom who is a huge fan of the show. And just before we get started, Alexa, um, I wanna just thank the team that helped put this together. Lisa Lepson, our VP of development, Robbie Kaplan, our director of major gifts and um, events, Dina Cooperman in marketing, Gabby Brooks, um, is also working in the development department, and uh, Mira Fox uh, from our editorial team. It takes a village to make a Zoomversation, and they are responsible for getting um, our wonderful panel together and all of you here. So Alexa, I wanna start with you. This show, which launched on, I think, May 20, March 26th, perfect timing for quarantine viewing, um, is like, it's like Unorthodox and the Tiger King are like winning the streaming, which I think is as weird as it can be and maybe as, as obvious as it can be. And I wonder if you can talk for a little bit about um, how, you, how you've experienced this insane outpouring of popularity, what kinds of reaction you're seeing from different communities. And of course, it's gotten great reviews from all the kind of mainstream press and also a lot of criticism um, from some insiders and other things. So I wonder if you can just give us a, set the table for us about what the last few weeks have been like for people inside the unorthodox world seeing this show launch and get such a huge reaction. Um, well, thank you for including me. It's really great to be here. Um, yes, it's been the last couple of weeks have been really wild and and crazy for all of us. Needless to say, we, we really did not expect any of this. We kind of, you know, made this show that's half in Yiddish and we were so lucky to that Netflix partnered with us on it. And I personally did not understand um, the true impact of what it would mean to launch a show in a, over 190 something countries at once until it happened. And having the sudden outpour of love from 
truly all over the world. Like suddenly we're in the top 10 of like Saudi Arabia and, and, and countries that I, I never ever would have considered them even being interested in our show are not just watching it, but uh, seemingly loving it. I, I think at, um, we, re we really tried hard on the one hand to make a show that is true to Deborah's story and and the and and also tell one that's um universal and that people can and watch and not feel alienated by while still being somewhat authentic in in uh, as much as as you know you can be when when making entertainment and television so um yeah it's been it's been really wild i mean I think getting messages from truly all over the world has been the most overwhelming and moving part and people seeing themselves in Esti and, and not just Jewish women and not just women, just really any kind of person you could ever imagine. And I think that speaks to at the end of the day that all of us know the feeling of yearning for maybe something different. and. You know, um, COVID-19 has been really bittersweet for, for us. And it, it's, it's truly weird to have made something that is uh, succeeding in this time. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a weird feeling and it's, it's certainly, yeah, it's, it's bittersweet, but um, yeah. Thanks, Alexa. Um, just a couple more housekeeping um, notes. If you're watching the, the Zoominar, um, please use, if you have a question that you'd like me to engage the panel in, please use the Q&A button on the bottom or left of your screen and not the chat button. If you have a comment you want to make, and I see some of the comments already in the chat, uh, the, the chat is a great place to be if you want to talk to your fellow attendees as well as the panelists. But it's hard for me to uh, track the questions that you put in the chat. The Q&A button is, is the place to put an actual question that you want me to answer. I do see that there's a, you're curious if we tried to get Deborah to join the panel. Um, uh, I don't think we did actually, I'm not, I'm not positive. I wasn't putting together, I didn't do all the programming. Um, I also have heard, see in the chat that we're having some, some people are having issues with the Facebook Live link. So we're on that, we're working on that. And I should say now too, that we're really grateful um, to have a partnership with Jewish Live and um, Lex Rofberg from Jewish Live has been really helping us broadcast these Zooms live and he's doing that today. There he is. And this is streaming, I think, both on our Facebook page and on the Jewish Live platform, if that's correct. Thank you, Lex. Um, I'm going to turn now to Javi to tell us a little bit about the reaction. I want to hear two things from you, Javi, to set, set us up a little bit. Is One is to build on what Lex is saying, what kind of reaction you're seeing from the world that you live in of these pe people who have had stories relatively similar to Esty. And then also maybe start to talk about this, this conversation was titled Reality Versus Fiction. So how you felt in terms of what you saw in the show, it's a, it's a fiction, nobody's pretending it's a documentary. Um, it's, a, it's a feature, it's, a, it's fictional, but um, how it does comport with reality or where you think it parts with reality. Uh, thank you, Jody. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. This is so much fun. Um, I've been having these little chats with my social circles, um, and it's just so much fun to be able to have a large conversation with so many people who are interested. Um, so something that I noticed when COVID hit, um, lots of people were forced to, you know, stay indoors and deal with loss of jobs and deal with, you know, big, big health crises and, and all, you know, the big issues that came along with it. Um, and in the footsteps community or folks who have left ultra-orthodoxy, it hit in a very specific way where folks now um, don't have family to lean on when they're in a crisis. And um, people who are already struggling financially are now um, even more at a loss and turning to footsteps staff for all these different supports. And one of the big ways it really affected footsteps members was, um, you know, so much uh, change of routine that people are forced to actually um, think about all the pain and loss that they've dealt with, all the trauma that came before. Um, I know personally that was such a big part of the early part of um, being home and quarantining. It was just having to confront some of the trauma that, you know, I left the community eight years ago and still there's so much unprocessed stuff that um, just having quiet time makes one confront it. And then Unorthodox came out 
and the conversations I was having in my head were all around me. It was on Facebook, it was in my communities, it was with friends and people reaching out to me who I hadn't heard from in years being like, this is inaccurate. How, do they, how dare they portray the community this way? It's really not true that people wear nightgowns when they're having sex, um, all this different stuff. Um, lots of fun conversations and also lots of having to really face head on the stuff that um, some of us have shoved really deep inside for a long time. Um, and Footsteps has had to quickly react as a staff, as a team, to figure out the best ways to support our members and, uh, and hold them you know, financially, emotionally, mentally through this double whammy. Um, and we're, we're doing so much and the community is really coming together and holding each other. It's kind of, you know, it's really fun too, um, to have these heated conversations about different people's experiences. Um, one thing that I tell when they ask me, is it accurate? You know, why did they, you know, this little nitpicky detail and this little thing, why did they get that wrong? And I'm just personally so grateful that people are telling our stories. I want the world to talk about us. I want the world to understand that we exist. I want people to be asking the questions. I want people who are still in the community to know that leaving is possible, that there are people that they'll, that they'll meet in the world outside that will understand what their journey has been just a little bit more because of uh, unorthodox having um, been told. And so uh, to answer your question, is it accurate? I mean, I'll say two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> Everybody has a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings. I think I'm just so glad it exists and I want more. I think it's a really good point, Javi, that it's like the process of the storytelling is, is the thing. Um, I should have started by asking you to give, if you can, just in the briefest of way, can you give us a little bit of a sense of the size of um, the community, that, the leavers? You know, how many people, the, uh, what, what does Footsteps kind of see and what, what do you know about the broader universe of people who leave the community? How common a story is Estes? Obviously not her own story, everybody has their own, but. Yeah. Um, I will say that I think Footsteps has at this point 1,700 members or so. Uh, 600 of them are active, um, actively engaging in our services um, currently um, and <laughs> I would say Some that, what's that? Some, many of them on this call. Um, and what I will say is that um, there are more men that leave than women do, but even that, those numbers have, um, have shifted over time. And now there's more women who are coming out and are, are coming out in terms of leaving ultra-orthodoxy. The language over there gets, uh, overlaps a lot. Um, and I will say that this is, this is a common phenomenon broadly, um, that this happens, that so many people are asking the questions and leaving. So many people that we don't know, so many people are, are not, you know, lots of people are not necessarily reaching right. out to footsteps um, and they're finding support elsewhere or like, like uh, Esti escaping to Berlin or finding completely new community right. outside of the space. But the, the numbers are high and climbing. Thank you. Ellie, I want to turn to you now. I, I feel like you, 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 want to, you have such an interesting perspective as an actor who also experienced a similar story. And what was it like for you to work on a story that maybe is so close or resonant, although I'm sure also very different, and how, how that fits into your kind of career and life and, and kind of what you thought about working on something that's so close to home Hi, Jody. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I mean, one of the one of the things that really kind of stuck with me, um, I so I grew up in the Hasidic community of Borough Park, and I um, uh, obviously very insular environment. Didn't have any real exposure to the outside world, to popular culture, to anything like that. My one real entree uh, to the outside world was um, I, I kind of very secretly had access to a TV. And I would spend, you know, I would sneak into the basement and spend all night watching TV while my parents were sleeping. And I'd watch about all these different cultures and learn so much about other cultures and about the outside world. And, and that's one of the things that actually planted the seeds for my eventual exit from the community. But one thing that stuck with me was that, um, uh, after after w watching a significant number of movies, I came across a movie called The Stranger Among Us, which mm -hmm. portrays the Hasidic community in, in, the, in, the, in the poorest and most inaccurate terms. And uh, it really bothered me 
uh, on so many levels. It bothered me to see that uh, people didn't, didn't take the slightest care in portraying my community. It, and it bothered me because it made me lose all confidence in art uh, as, as a tool for education. Um, I started thinking, well, if they got this wrong, who's to say what else they got wrong? And how can I possibly rely on, on film or TV to teach me about anything or anyone? Um, so I, I, I always really cared about accuracy and representation. So when I, when I had the opportunity, uh, when Alexa actually reached out to me um, to consult on the show and to actually make sure that the show is authentic and, and representative, um, I, I just jumped at it. Uh, so it was, it was an incredible opportunity. Um, I actually started out as a consultant. The acting part came later. Um, I, I wasn't necessarily expecting to act in the project as well. And um, so- I remember how you asked for that. I remember how that happened, Ellie. Yes, <laughs> what <happened>? yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I have to say I did hope to, to act in it as well, but I didn't want to kind of, my philosophy is first get your foot in the door, make sure you have the consulting job, and then ask for a role. Um, so, and, and I'm not sure exactly what conversation you're alluding to, Alexa, but. Well, well um, exactly like that. It was just funny. Yeah. You one day were like, well, by the way, I also act. And if there was anything one day, if you guys feel like da da da, and like a couple months later, Ellie's our rabbi. <laughs> He's that talented. Um, which, which also, every Hasidish boy grows up wanting to be a rabbi, wanting to be a rabbi. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the boyhood so you dream. To leave the community and be a rabbi. Exactly. Uh, I got my, I had my cake and ate it too. So uh, it, was, it was a dream come true. Rabbi Abby Stein. So Rabbi, Rabbi Abby Stein had almost exactly the same experience, right? Yes. So, okay. um, Abby, I want to kick it to you. Um, you can tell us a little bit about your story, but also I would love to hear, as Javi started to talk about, just about the way the experience of watching this and watching everybody else watch this has been for you after you know, a, a personal journey, um, what it's like to now have the world kind of engaging and fighting over. Is this real? Is this, you know? Amazing. And I actually have, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. I did yesterday two international events one with the Jewish community in Russia and one with the Jewish community in Argentina, a total of thousands of people. And so I actually have like a live report back on, it was my first like big event after the show came out, after having done hundreds of uh, speeches and trying to talk about the Hasidic community before the show came out. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, so personally, I would say parts of the show are like copy paste of my story. I grew up in Hasidic Williamsburg, I went to an elementary school that was pretty much Satmar, wasn't kind of like a private school within Satmar, I'm not gonna go into the details. Um, I knew people, I know a lot of people, for example, I see had an issue with um, Esti's dad. They were like, oh, most Hasidic people are not drunk. And that is kind of accurate, but I can think offhand of like five like characters, so to speak, in Hasidic Williamsburg that he reminds me of, uh, and so on. However, at the same time, I had a radically different experience, especially with my family. I had a loving family. My family was, um, while in the Hasidic community, if like your mom has left and is a lesbian and your dad is a drunk, you're gonna be second or third class. My family was like first class plus. I come from rabbinic families on all sides. Um, Ellie mentioned before that every Hasidic child grows up wanting to be a Rebbe, and my family, it was like, this is the only thing you can do. You're going to be a Rebbe. This is what's going to happen. Um, so that part was um, obviously quite different, and I also, I was raised as a man. I don't think I ever was a man, but that's how I was raised in the Hasidic mm -hmm. community, and that experience is also at times very different, but I think I was also very aware of the experiences of women in the community. I wouldn't say I experienced it, but I was very aware, both because I have eight sisters, um, so I grew up with um, sisters all the time, and because I don't know, I can't talk for other Hasidic people who are raised as men, but for me, I talk a very keen, I took a very keen interest in the experience of women because of my own personal gender identity. And to give examples, and I, I sometimes read it, and I wrote about it in my book, I, when I was nine years old, I wrote a prayer that was about a prayer to God, which was, I think, all we knew at the time. 
saying that I want to wake up as a girl, but the details that I express are, I want to have a lot of babies. I want to have the nicest Shabbos table. I want to create a big family, which were very much the ideas that I picked up of what it meant to be a woman um, in that community. And I will say to you the second part of the impact that it has had. So um, I, I obviously, I don't know, I'm going to be honest, I was a bit involved, not remotely as much as Alexa and um, Ellie, but I was on set in Berlin for two days with Ellie and then um, was as an extra dressed up as a Hasidic woman, uh, one just a Hasidic oh. woman, and another scene a pregnant Hasidic woman um, when the show filmed in Brooklyn. So I obviously had exposure to the show before, but I do have to say that the biggest, and, and it's similar to what Javi said, I'm a huge fan of sharing our stories. I mean, I literally wrote a book about it. Um, I think it's extremely powerful, both as people who grew up Hasidic and as LGBTQ people. And one of the things I experienced the difference between public awareness of our stories through TV in, within the trans community. When I started out in 2014, it was before Orange is the New Black, before Sense8, before Caitlyn Jenner, all of these things that we might not agree with everything. I might not be that, oh, Orange is the New Black is the perfect representation of the trans experience. I do love LeBron Cox, but, and, and so on, yet, it changed the public perception to such an extreme that we could move on and have a better conversation. We could move on from what does it mean to be trans to how do we make sure that trans people are welcomed in our society, that trans people get what we need. I feel very similar, and I can say that after speaking today with thousands of people who know very little about the Hasidic community, who are not from the US, that the quality of the conversation has moved on. The quality, it's no longer as much of, what does it mean? And like, you grew up in New York and you didn't speak English? How is that possible? What was the first movie you watched? We're able to have a conversation that, what, that I wanna have, a conversation of how do we support people leaving, a conversation of how do we support people like Javi and Footsteps who are supporting those who are leaving. We could, and hopefully this is the first of many. So it's not a question, to me the question isn't, oh, is this exactly accurate? I do think that everything in it is done and, and having spoken, having had these conversations with Ellie sometimes even during production, I know I can testify that he did as the, better than the best of trying to get as accurate as possible within the framework of a TV show. So that's Abby, point. Abby, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. I, you gave me a great jumping off point for my next question, but also people in the chat want your book. So can you put a link to the, your book into the chat? Yeah, I will do that um, right that now. I will say it's easy. It's tinyurl.com slash becoming Eve, but I will put it in the chat. Okay, great. And I um, thank you very much for that. So one of the things Abby just mentioned, was what you know that you would get asked growing up in New York not speaking English so I want to turn to you Rachel to talk a little bit about um, the way Yiddish plays out in this film in this in the series excuse me um, it's interesting because coming on the heels of to some extent Stissel which also I think for many of us was like the first time we really saw Yiddish kind of using I, I, I went to a couple of um, public events where they were talking about how they how the, some of the actors who didn't know Yiddish and how they learned it or whatever. Um, there's a much more extensive use of Yiddish in this series. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how they did with the Yiddish, but also what you think it means for such a mainstream program to be used to bring bringing Yiddish to this much larger public, including like people in Saudi Arabia. What does that mean for, for our beloved uh, Mama Lushen? Great did I say question. that right? Yeah, Mama Lushen is the right word. So Ellie mentioned A Stranger Among Us with Melanie Griffith. It wasn't just a bad movie. The Yiddish was atrocious. I couldn't even understand what they were saying. And a, a lot of directors just weren't doing their homework. And it wasn't until I think the turning point was a Canadian film called Felix and Mira with uh, Luisa Tversky, who we call Tversky. Uh, an amazing actor from the Hasidic community who spoke Yiddish beautifully. I felt like I was on the screen with him. I felt like I was a part of that movie. And then came Stissel, where you had a lot more Yiddish dialogue going on. But if you'll notice, it's mostly with the older people. The only time you have young people speaking Yiddish, Gitti and her husband, uh, is that the kids not understand what they're saying. And then here comes unorthodox and like, 
I heard somebody say 50%, but I think it's more than that. I think 75% of it is in Yiddish. And you really, I think people love it because they love the authenticity. I mean, imagine if we had a film where these Hasidic families were speaking English with a Yiddish accent. It really would have lost the, the real feeling of their culture and the way they relate to each other. And I just want to take up one of the sentences I heard early on in the first scene where um, uh, he's sitting at the uh, Shabbos table. He just realized she left home. And one of his, I don't know if it's his sister or his sister-in-law says, says, It's always something with that girl, isn't it? And the way she said it, it just rolled off her tongue and I was in. And I felt like throughout the movie, I, I had misgivings about it, but not about the language. I just thought it was really a whole world being recreated. In addition to the mahogany furniture, the, the way that the uh, clothes were designed, but also the Yiddish and the fact that the Yiddish was not just among the older people, but all ages and in the bedroom. Yiddish has always been kind of poked fun at. It's not a sexy language. And even though the sex wasn't happening there, but the fact that they were trying to get it on in Yiddish was really fun to watch. So there are already, um, I think, 76 really brilliant questions in the Q&A. So thank you all for that. I'm going to try um, to raise as many of them as I can in the time we have. Um, the first few I'm seeing really are about some of the criticism that have come from either current or other former members of the Hasidic community about the question of accuracy. So, you know, Alison Gall says, oh, sorry, that's a different one. Joan Sher says there was an article who said the film, film didn't paint a fair picture, especially the sex scenes. Um, Norma Bernstock says essentially the same thing. We did have a couple of pieces printed in the foreword, one talking about um, that some of the inaccuracies in terms of the humorlessness of some of the women and another just recently on Friday by a member of the Hasidic community in London who says um, people don't have sex with their clothes on, although we got responses already from people who said, I do have sex with my clothes on. So later there'll be a poll of who has sex with their um, night coats on. I wanna, you, you all have already, I mean, Javi and Abby, I think particularly talked about this question of universality and specificity and, and the balance between those. I, I do want El Alexa and Ellie particularly to address these criticisms. And I wanna actually point out that it's interesting, Frida Wiesel, who is the author of the um, first forward piece that was very critical. She said, in her piece, she said, but the small things that are wrong reflect the larger thing that is wrong. But I think in some ways what Javi and Abby maybe were saying is, is sort of the inverse of that, right? That it, um, for them, it didn't matter whether the strimals were fake or the sex had the wrong clothes. It was really about this, this big pick, bringing that, the universal story of transition of leaving a community uh, that, that had been private to you into the public sphere. So anyhow, you've heard the criticism, Alexa, from me and from other people. Why don't you start and then Ellie can jump in and. Well, I, th I think Javi can go too. <laughs> right. I think um, no show would be complete if there weren't criticisms. Let's start off with that. And I don't mean to relativize anybody's uh, criticism. I think, you know, similar when, when you watch shows or, or movies from, let's say, 80s New York, right? Or 70s New York. I've never met a single person who lived through that period who didn't criticize something about, oh, but that's not how they dress actually. Like, that's not how the music was actually. And I feel like when you make something that's about an experience that many, that most ex Hasids have on one way or another been to and now are not part of anymore, it's it's very hard to make something that can represent truly everyone's experience or emotions that are connected to that. And it's in a way, wasn't what we intended to do, right? We cared about Deborah Feldman's story and then about what we made with it, Esty's story, right? And, and I think it's tricky. In a way, the more you know, the more you have the potential to be disappointed about the world recreated, right? It's, it's, it's kind of where we're, we're opening the veil, but we're only opening the veil in a way to people that don't know it, right? Um, so I, I appreciate that that Abby um, kind of sees the universality in Esty's emotions that she can connect to, to Esty's feelings. I mean, I, I feel like that's what we 
worked much harder to now it was really important to make something as authentic but very important as possible right because as as you already pointed out it is not a documentary and um when you make something you you're trying to tell a story that's captivating and you have a budget so it's kind of these things come together and many many choices right so i do have to say that things that um certain things are decisions right so I, so I'll, I'll give you a small example and and this was a bit, i argued with ellie for hours over this you know when 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 esty gets married and she we wears that very specific headpiece even though she la later wears a wig a lot of hasidic people will say well that can't there's a mistake here right um, if you if you wear that specific headpiece, then you should wear a spitzel later, or you you don't wear a wig or this kind of wig later. We were actually pretty aware of this. Ellie was like, I don't know, guys, like please don't put this headpiece on her. This is wrong. I mean, I need to say that this Ellie told us this is wrong, and we were like, okay, if the worst thing we do is like put this headpiece that we love so much, knowingly that is wrong, on Esty we can live with it as long i feel like our guiding tool was always if we make mistakes a are we um sacrificing the character's journey or really hurting the community by making these mistakes or creating some kind of idea of a community that is by and large wrong um that was always our guiding tool so in terms of you know the a fake for a hat and et cetera, you're like, okay, we're not gonna be hurting anybody's really by, by, by creating, making these kinds of mistakes. Plus I have to say, again, we were very aware, aware. I mean, we didn't wanna hurt any animals with making these hats, plus they're so expensive. Um, <laughs> but I have to say also in the mainstream kind of secular reviews, like none of this is ever mentioned. No, of course not. I mean, this the is story. A, I mean, this, story, this is always this question of who it's made for, and this is a story that was made for the, a mainstream audience of, of whom people who know the difference between the headpieces is a very, very small sector. So, Ellie, tell us about how how that how that felt for you, and how how it's been to hear some of the criticism from people who are actually very similar to you, right? Who have who have left, who know, right. Um, so obviously, first of all, no two experiences are the same, right? And the problem is that um, it, it's, it's somewhat ironic that people that are so particular about their own experiences being validated are so quick to invalidate other people's experiences. But um, uh, with regard to these different things that are raised as kind of inauthenticities, um, also very ironic that one of the first places we went to for costumes was to Kroos Stramlich, the, the, the largest Stramlich maker in the world. And uh, we asked to purchase Stramlichs, and they said, uh, we will never sell them to you. Uh, in other words, it would be offensive to use real Stramlich in our TV show. Uh, now we're hearing that it's offensive to use fake ones. So it's a little <laughs> bit confusing. But um, I'm just happy to say that no Hasidim or animals were harmed in the making of this movie, of this uh, show rather. But um, regarding the sex scene, um, of course, Hasidic teaching tells us that the uh, couple, husband and wife, should be naked and not wearing any clothes. Um, I mean, one could argue that whether or not that means completely naked or at the point of their union, there shouldn't be anything separating them which of course is why you wear a nightgown, so you can just lift it up, which is what they do. Uh, that's one conversation. As for the kind of the awkwardness, the terrible, terrible awkwardness of their actual sex, any, anybody can tell you that whether or not that is prescribed is besides the point. The fact of the matter is that every, almost that most bridegrooms- Many, many, the word you're looking for many, is many. Many, yes, correct. Many bridegrooms, have no proper sex education, religious or otherwise, and find themselves utterly lost in the bedroom. Uh, so the question is not what the books tell us to do. The question is what actually happens. And those sex scenes repeat themselves over and over again in hundreds of Hasidic marital bedrooms all over the world. 
uh, I cannot tell you how many people have told me personally that this is exactly what their wedding night was like. And this is exactly what their first year of marriage was like. Thankfully, most people figure it out eventually, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of heartache to get there. Um, so people who are middle-aged and have a happy sex life and say, this is not what my sex life is like, um, are either disingenuous or they simply don't remember what their first year of marriage was like. Uh, I want to broaden it to, to get more people in the conversation but and, and add some of these questions that are, uh, a lot of people are asking about the Hasidic community or the Satmar's community reaction or pushback. Beverly Rosen asked that. Um, also, um, Sebastian, are they aware, are Haredim aware of the show? Are they watching the show? Um, people are also asking about, is there sexual abuse? Uh, Caroline Lindemann is asking about, is there sexual abuse, particularly in the Satmar sect? So I think that Javi and Abby are probably hearing as much from people still in the Hasidic world um, about backlash, or are they watching it as Alexa and Ellie? And maybe Rachel's hearing it too, so maybe all of you can jump on that. I think Javi wants to go, and then we, we have no problem with talking here, so I'm just trying to parse out all the minutes we have. Keep going. All right, um, so what I can say broadly is the Hasidic community is not a monolith. Um, bro you know, already there's such a huge distinction between Chabad, Lubavitch, and other Hasidic sects. Satmar versus like the other, you know, Satmar seems to be more fundamentalist in some areas than other of the Hasidic communities. Um, I, I will say that I didn't grow up in Satmar and that sex scene was so intense for me because that's what my wedding night felt like for me. Um, it, was, it was so evocative to see that on the screen and it felt really, I felt so seen um, for, the, for that level of intimacy and awareness about around the bedroom. And something that I think will answer a broader question here, if I may. Um, I was studying with my 13-year-old daughter for a test uh, this year, for a test for her, the Hasidic school she attends. And she was memorizing and she was saying things like, a man is worth 50, a woman is worth 10, a child is worth five. I'm, I'm making up the numbers, it's not exactly that. And I was uh, horrified. And I said, can you explain to me what, this, what you're actually studying? And she showed me that it was about counting the value of uh, people's contributions to the building of the Mishkan. And a, a man's value was worth 50 coins, because a man between certain ages was worth 50 coins because of their ability to put in this amount of labor. I'm probably misquoting this, but my point is what I want you to take away is when a bunch of sixth graders are sitting in a classroom and memorizing this just rote information, um, the ideas are getting stuck in their heads value as a woman is this, a man's value is that. Um, and so I, I liked, I'd like to point this out for, to make a larger message, right? So I was taught certain messages at, at home about a woman's value in the family and intimacy and the beauty of sex in the Jewish home and all of that. And then I would go to school and get different messages about the laws and the different teachings. And then I would hear from my neighbors and different Hasidic sects and different communities. And my, my ex-husband was learning his own classes, his own messages in yeshiva, his own ideas. And then the two of us were thrown together without knowing each other on a wedding night and expected to perform a really intimate act without having any kind of unified message. And what results is the hodgepodge of ideas and the big messages. So sure, one might say Judaism values, you know, a, a, a couple being naked with each other and having real intimacy and all of that. The reality is that's not what it ends up looking like for the two people in that room because they're learning underlying messages about modesty and body shame and guilt and sex negativity. And all of that comes into the bedroom of these two people who are practically strangers to each other before that night. And it, it can feel for some people, and it did for me, like rape on your first night, your first time ever having a sexual experience. Thank you, Javi. I know <laughs> it's very personal. Um, as I mentioned, my mom is on this call, so we will not be talking about my wedding night here. But um, <laughs> I want to turn to you, Abby, to say also that um, we've got, by the way, um, something several hundred people also watching on the Facebook Live, at least. So um, I'm glad to know people got in. And there are a couple of questions coming in from there that I'm going to share. Um, one, I think you can answer pretty quickly about are there organizations addressing um, domestic violence within Hasidic communities? And specifically for Abby, so maybe you can fold that in, can, whether we'd love you to address 
some of the nuances of the gender roles as you see them unfolding in the series. Um, obviously, your particular experience um, from within the community uh, gives particular insight into that. So yeah. thanks. And I want to say, and I think that answers a lot of the things that um, we spoke about a minute ago. Um, after watching the show, so I'm still in touch with, um, I think it's five out of 100 of my classmates from back in the day, from Yeshiva. And one of the people, someone I talk to a lot, obviously not, not going to mention a name, calls me up and they were like, oh my God, like the sex ed? Since when are they being told so much? And then we were talking back to the fact, so, and, and I, I grew up and I got like my sex ed envisioned from the community. And there, there was one designated person by the Rebbe who was his son, who was also my cousin and also married to my mom's cousin. I'm gonna stop there. And he was the 60 year old guy who is currently, he became the Rebbe after his dad passed away. And the sex had pretty much consisted of this and this, quite literally, a pen and fingers. And talking about the clothing also, he actually is telling everyone that ideally wear your nightgown and pull it up, unless if that doesn't work, like you try a few times and that doesn't work, you should take it off. But point I being- I to throw, throw, Abby, but I just want to throw in there, one of the other things I've been hearing about is people can't believe that there's no, there was no, no, no idea of a kiss, a touch. Touching later in the later in the series, we see uh, Yankee being told by the at the brothel to touch her face, and we see Esty's reaction to being kissed. And so, maybe, if you can work that into, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yes, and literally what I was told, I was sitting down again. We're talking here to a sixty-year-old guy who I know is a family member who is also a rabbi. He's telling me, "Okay, take off all your clothes, leave just your tzitzit and your nightgown on. Go into the bed, lay down next to her, ask her." how she is feeling. After a few minutes, ask her if she is ready. I'm translating literally word for word. I will never forget that. If she says she is ready, get on top of her, kiss her on the cheek, and that's all. I didn't know about kissing on the mouth until I got online two years later. Kiss her on the cheek and ask her to take your, what he would say, aver, which literally translates to organ or your piece of your body, and ask her to guide it towards her osomakum, which means like her that place without naming it. Cover yourself with a blanket. And then he took the pan, spread his fingers, mm -hmm. and there are two halls, you go in the upper hall. Literally, that was all of it. Thankfully, yeah. I knew my ex, I knew her family. I think I, given my gender identity, I try to think a lot. And could be there other Hasidic husbands who think about that. Um, I don't know, but I definitely try to think a lot. What is she experiencing? Personally, I was lucky. I had two hours. I got married in the big blizzard of 2010 when the sanitation went on strike. We drove home from, New Year from Williamsburg where the wedding was to Muncie where we were living. And we had two hours to have a conversation where the second part, we had an hour to discuss, describe it in detail, which is how I know that she got told even less. And she was mostly told, you don't have to know a lot. Your husband is gonna go into you. That's what she was told. You just follow his lead. That is all she was told. So way less than Esty. But thankfully, because I was able to have that conversation, it was, I think, relatively okay. But I remember talking about the gender um, roles as a whole, I remember having these conversations and I have one sister who speaks to me. I can't say who, she will get into trouble. But I have one sister who still speaks with me now. And she didn't watch it, she doesn't watch TV at all. But I had this conversation with her, like, tell me how you were feeling. Tell me what was your experience? Because I was curious to hear because yes, I was at least socially on the other side of this. And what she told me is like, I can tell you a bit of the details, but that's not what matters. Because the, she's like the biggest message that I took away from my college teacher is that I need to, two things, I need to make sure my husband is happy and I need to do everything he is saying because I need to have a lot of babies. That's what she's like, yes, they, she was told some of the details, but the biggest message that she felt speaking with a college teacher, and I'm talking someone who is still Hasidic, that she felt that the biggest, the, the point of the sex set was make sure your <clears throat> husband is happy and make sure you do everything right so you can have babies. Like she's telling me she was given more details about what to do after sex, things that I don't know if they're scientifically accurate, but what they believe 
is going to help you conceive, such as like stay laying on your back, um, uh, try to not stand up for like 10 to 15 minutes. Have you, I don't know if you were told similar things, but I know that's what she was told. And I would say one final thing about the focus on both the gender roles and the focus on having babies. I had, before I left, and I had one of my older sisters who is a lot more religious than a lot of people, even in my own family. And I used to tease her when I was leaving and I was like in this rebellious stage. I'm like, I don't get it. You're just a baby factory. Don't ever tell that to a woman, not even a specific woman. But I was in a rebellious stage and I was like, what are you doing? Like you have no goals in life. And I think her, when I think back to it, her response is what gets me even more because her response at one of the times, usually she would ignore me, but one of the times she was like, well, yes, that's my tough kid. Tough kid is like my goal. My, I am on the world to have a lot of babies. So this is not, obviously, yes, people have different experiences, but I think I wanted to put out that piece to say that the show, so Ellie, in case you were wondering, you went way too far. And in some families and in some communities, it all depends on your own experience. And again, and there are people even who are still Hasidic who felt that. Like I'm talking to someone who is still Hasidic who was like, the first thing is like, so much, where are they getting that from? So we have, um, we, we have so many questions. Um, like we have a hundred questions on here. We've got another thousand people on Facebook Live asking questions. So I really, and we have about 15 minutes left. So um, I wanna tick through some, some, there are a bunch that really are for probably Alexa. Um, people want to know how much the budget was, which I guess is a factual question. People, there are a bunch of, I'm sorry I'm not calling out your names. I'm now kind of lost in the stream here, so I apologize, but you're all dear to us. Um, I want to, there's a bunch of questions about the number of episodes, that, sorry. So people want to know the budget. People want to know why it departs so much from Deborah Feldman's book. Um, there's been a lot written about it departing a lot, but maybe a, a little bit of an answer about why. Um, then there's some questions about the, um, the, the number of episodes. And I know myself, I totally was like, what, that's it? Like, what happens next? This is just getting interesting. So people wanna know both, um, is there gonna be another season and when, what happens next? But also kind of why choose to have a format that was it's a, pretty unusual for a four um, episode format. And then after Alexa ticks through some of those sort of tuchless-ish questions, I, the, one of the bigger questions that's out there is really about um, how people, the, whether people are concerned about how a show like this, what, um, how it portrays Jews to non-Jews and what the reaction is and then how, and how do you deal as Jewish artists or Jewish leaders with that question of like, what will they think if we tell our truth? Um, so that, I'm going to put that out there for Ellie and Javi and Rachel to think about while Alexa ticks us through some of those questions about the show itself. Okay, quickly. <laughs> I'm not able to share the production budget. Um, the show was always intended to be four episodes. It's a limited series. I also need to disappoint there are not, there are not more episodes being planned right now. Um, and um, wait, what was the other thing? <laughs> what happens to ST? <laughs> What do you want to happen to SC? You know, um, check in. Why does it depart so much from the book? Reading from the book, yes, very important. Our show is inspired by Deborah Feldman's Unorthodox. It is not based on. Um, this has many reasons. I would say one of the very big reasons is that Deborah is um, my age. She is very much still experiencing the transition of leaving years later. Her life is still unfolding and we felt it wasn't appropriate to um, kind of unpack something that is, that is, you know, that in a way just happened. Um, in addition to that, we really wanted to, Deborah Feldman lives in Berlin now and we wanted to bring Esty to Berlin sooner. And, um, you know, we, we uh, thankfully got Deborah's blessing and just wanted to, you know, I think with book adaptations, it's very important to remember that at least this is how I see it, that it's about an essence and it's about a feeling and it's about um, getting something larger right. And we were always very nervous before every dinner with Deborah where we told her, okay, look, we kind of you, we know your your husband in the book isn't a really developed character. It's a memoir. We're always in Deborah's head in the memoir. We had to externalize uh, her from 
inside her head, which is what happens in any adaptation of a memoir, in that we wanted to develop Yankee, you know? We uh, met Jeff Wilbush, we wanted to develop Moisha, we developed Moisha with Jeff Wilbush, right? Who is an ex Hasid himself. And, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of, a lot of, we can go through every single reason of, of every single decision, but this is essentially that, you know, um, whenever you read a good book, think about how much you're in one character's head and in that person's thoughts, right? And if, and if you adapted a book exactly the way it is, you'd actually have a pretty silent heroine all the time watching all the other people doing things. And that doesn't make for a good story to be told on screen, unfortunately, you know? Yeah, so I, I think, wanted, sorry, I wanted to jump in quickly because I had this conversation. I can't share much many details, but I can say I'm allowed to share that it has been publicly kind of quasi publicly announced. I'm working on a, on a show that is, um, or, or a movie, we haven't decided that far yet, that is based on my book. And literally I was talking with the producer just last week and that's what you were telling me, that we are gonna need to develop, like you're talking specifically about my parents, maybe some of my siblings, that I don't go into talking about too much. And I actually did make an effort in the book to describe kind of what it is, what it was to be Hasidic. And literally almost word for word, I'm, we'll have to check with Alexa later if they know each other of what Alexa was just saying. I mean, it's kind of, you know, when you're in and you, in, you need to show somebody experience something and not just have them describe it, you know, it makes for a really good book, but yeah. And then, you know, I also, I just, I, and I just want to circle back one second is that, you know, when, when we brought Ellie Rosen on board to consult and then to play the rabbi, you know, these kinds of really active, these things don't happen in a vacuum. These kinds of conversation, all these conversations, the sex scenes, all of it are many hours of conversations about, okay, how far can we go? How far do we not go? What do we do? And in terms of what will people think, I would like to just quickly say, you know, um, and then everybody should else speak as a Jewish artist. I need to say that one of our main things about creating Unorthodox was to create full characters that really experience something, that this is a, also a plot driven, but also a character driven story that we are, this is Esty's story, okay? And this is Esty's story. And as long as we don't claim to be telling the story of the world, the story of the entire Satmar community, I always felt like we can put Esty in situations that are uncomfortable because we are exploring her and what, how she experiences those situations, both in Berlin and in Williamsburg, you know? I think that, so I think one of the questions that people have is like, but is it good for the Jews, right? That's yeah. I, I, you know what, turn on, the, turn on the news, that's bad for the Jews. You know, like, I, I do have to say, like, the more it is Jewish life is not monolithic, Jews are not monolithic, and the more complicated characters we show, the more flawed people we show, the more people will understand that we're like everyone else. And I have to say, like, you know, it, the idea that we as Jews constantly need to put ourselves forward and defend everybody's Jew, every Jewish person's or everything's actions is wrong as well. We as Jews also need to be able to say that somebody, that people are being wrong within our community. I have to say, what will other people think if we silence the people within our community who are suffering, then that causes on a larger scale more suffering than admitting to the outside world that that is happening in and of itself. If we don't tell Esty's story, then Esty is silenced. You know, and I, as a Jew, like, feel more responsibility towards our SD, our fictional SD, than I do towards, you know, what will people think of the Jews? That's a, that's just a I huge... I Abby and Abby want to jump in, so oh, go ahead. Yeah. All right, now you got me going, and it's almost over. Oh, no, don't stop. You're, you're magical, Alexa. That was a magnificent answer, and I just want to say... Is this show good for the Jews? Yes, it's good for the Jews like Esty. It's good for the Jews like me and Abby and Ellie. It's good for Jews like us who were trapped in horrible marriages, who were stuck in a community where we didn't have options, where we didn't have choice. It's good for all the Estes that are currently leaving the community and coming to footsteps and struggling you know, with loss of family, with loss of income, with starting from the ground when they're 25 years old and not having an education and not having the resources they need to get land on their feet, 
you know, we get to see those stories at Footsteps all the time. And I'm going to post a link um, to Footsteps for folks who are asking, how can we help? How can we support people like Essie? Um, donate to Footsteps. Footsteps is seeing these people on the ground. People who, like Essie, I don't, we don't know the end that people are asking for more of Esty's story. Um, you know, there are, there are so many Estes and the end of their story is they struggle. We struggle. We fight for custody of our children. We fight to just, you know, figure out how to get a GED and go to college and have big futures. So um, yes, there are, if you want to know the end of Esty's story, reach out to Footsteps. We'll tell you how to create the end to Esty's story. Please, so please do put that I, wait one second. I, so, um, Javi's going to put that link in the chat, but also just be assured, I know it's hard to transcribe the chat quickly. We will be emailing you, everybody who's on this call, everybody who registered for the Zoom and who is on Facebook Live, we will be emailing out a summary of this conversation with some of these links, with the video to this conversation, okay? So, and you are welcome to share that with anybody you know, of course. I want to also say we have only five minutes left, and I know people are starting to leave to go to their next Zoom event or meeting. Um, I'd really appreciate the panelists being here and all of you joining us for this incredibly interesting conversation. Um, everybody who's on this call is also going to be uh, signed up for a free month subscription to The Forward. We've been doing these events once or twice a week. We have another um, one tomorrow night. Bacha Ungar Sargon, our brilliant um, opinion editor, is hosting two of our columnists, Ari Hoffman and Joel Swanson, in a debate over how Jews should or shouldn't celebrate Yom Ha'atzma'ut. As you know, tomorrow is Yom Ha'atzma'ut and Wednesday, Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israeli Independence Day. So tune into that at seven o'clock tomorrow night. Um, we're going to have drinks at that. You have to bring your own drinks, actually. But um, please join us for that. I want to thank, again, Jewish Live, Lisa Lepson, Dina Cooperman, Gabby Brooks, um, Mira Fox, Le uh, Lex Rothberg, I believe, and all of our wonderful panelists. So, and all of you for just these incredibly thoughtful and great questions. And I'm so sorry I don't have more time to get to all of them. But I'm going to give everybody just a chance for a brief last word. Um, Abby, I, first of all, I forgot to mention that Abby was one of our amazing Forward 50 last year in 2019, so I'm glad um, to have her on this panel. I'm going to actually start with Ruchel, um, and then we'll whip around to go Ruchel, Abby, um, I think Javi, that was your last word, it was very powerful, and then Ellie and Alexa to close us out, okay? So just give us your, whatever's come up for you in the last few minutes of this great conversation, give us a couple of quick thoughts, really quick. So Alexa, I just want to tell you, I thought that the classical music piece was so beautiful because what she was doing when she was watching them on the stage, she was hearing beautiful harmony. But in real life, there is not beautiful harmony because we're human beings. And I thought that was such a great comparison of that music that's perfect and real life, which is not. I just wanted to add that that's not in Deborah Feldman's book. And I thought it was a great touch. Thank you. I agree. Such a powerful scene, but please don't say Alexa's name again because my Alexa is responding to it. <laughs> Call it Echo. <laughs> Abby, go ahead. First of all, yes, 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 yes. To everything Alexa and Javi um, have said over the past few minutes, I want to say this. I wouldn't be here today. I, sorry for saying it in a not a better way and trigger warning, but I don't know if I would be alive if it wasn't for people who have shared these stories before, if it wasn't for organizations like Footsteps making something like this happen. And I used to get the same thing when I started my activism in the LGBTQ community. And people were like, you keep pointing out how your parents rejected you, how people in, who are LGBTQ in the Hasidic community very often have it a lot more, just an added, I don't wanna say more wars are better, but an added hardship. And you, by you, you talking about it, um, it might bring some hate. I'm sorry to say it in a different way, and we don't have a lot of time for new ones. So I couldn't care less. We can't think about it. This is a matter of life or death for people. I know it's for me, and I know it's for thousands of people out there, wherever it's the LGBTQ community, wherever it's people growing up in communities where they can't live. It's not a question of us being silent and going on. It's a question of us being silent and not helping people that need to hear these stories, people that need to have footsteps, need to have the support to survive. So sorry if you feel a bit insulted, but we don't have the capacity not to share the story, these stories. And I'd like to add to that, that um, it's interesting that people are so concerned about anti-Semitism 
and how Jews are being portrayed. Yet every non-Jewish critic who's reviewed the show has said that the show paints a beautiful picture and a very human picture of the Hasidic community that we've never seen before. We get messages from all over the world of people who are identifying with Hasidic characters in ways they never have before. It's very simple, just like Alexa said, people identify with stories that portray three-dimensional characters, that portray characters who have conflicts, who have struggles, who do bad things as well as good things. The key to making people like us more is not to put uh, propaganda pieces out there. Uh, it's to show that we are human and we have the same problems that everybody else does. Yeah. Uh, it's such a, uh, one, before you jump in, Lex, I just, you know, um, it's so great for me to hear you all talk about the importance of storytelling. I mean, that's, that's what we're all about here at The Forward. That's what, you know, my whole career has been about. And I just think it's like, right, we have to tell stories. And what's so powerful about both this show and um, Schissel, I think, together is the idea that we're telling a very specific subculture story that has all this universality to it. And I think that that's, that's what everybody's so responding to. And the haters are responding to it and the lovers are responding to it. It's just like, oh my God, yearning, transitioning, moving in and out of a community. That is something very powerful for all of us. So again, I'm gonna give Alexa the last word and then and totally shut up, but thank you so much for coming all of you on the chat um, and on Facebook Live and on Jewish Live. We're so proud to have brought you this conversation and we're gonna continue to put together uh, the most compelling programs we can during this time when we're all um, seeking to connect and be a community uh, together. The forward is really working to help us uh, be a community and serve the community. So thank you for joining us today. And Alexa, thank you for the show. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me and including me and thank you. I mean, you know, I, I really don't have any big words, just thank you. And um, everybody go continue, look in, look in the mirror of your own community and figure out what you can do, I guess, you know, would be the larger thing, but just, you know, read good books, watch good things. What else are you watching? What should we watch next now that this terribly short show has left us wanting to know more? <laughs> oh my God, okay, I hate to be put on the spot. I, um, if you really like comedy and if you're maybe, uh, I, I really enjoyed Pen15, but that's about the 90s, about being a teenager. I really loved that show. Um, I recently watched, oh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, a gorgeous movie. Actually, that's what everybody should watch. It's on Hulu. Really, Celine Sciamma, the most beautiful film I've seen in, in forever. Mm -hmm. What's your next project that we should watch out for? Not sharing that yet, but okay. I'll let you, I'll let the forward know. <laughs> okay, and Abby, is the, you're, you're working on a TV show or a movie about becoming Eve? Uh, we're fo our first focus is a documentary that is already happening. We've already filmed for like uh, 20 to 30 hours. We're going to film like 100, as some of you might know how these things work. But, um, and then there's, it was actually announced, we're still working out the quirks, but it was in v Variety Magazine. I think that's how it's called. There was an article about it. Um, so yes, um, there was uh, uh, some agreement. Th there's stuff in the work. That's as much as I can say. But this is officially um, yeah. over, but if everybody, Rachel, what are, if, if it's officially over, but for those who are still with us, which is 800 people, people want to give their other watching recommendations. Rachel, what are you watching? Uh, well, aside from making, producing Yiddish cooking shows, uh, I really don't have too much time to watch anything else, but I'm studying Hebrew. I'm, you know, I'm taking advantage of the coronavirus era. Well, I'm, not, I'm not socializing, so I'm sitting and reading Hebrew for hours and my vocabulary is really improving. I really want to join a cooking show. I do cooking all the time. Oh, oh yes, we have, we have to have you on. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. we're going to talk. Javi has a show recommendation, I think. What are you watching? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been mentioned in the chat, but I just want to give a shout out to one of us, the, the documentary on Netflix, which can give you a, a deeper understanding of what it's like for folks who leave ultra-Orthodoxy and the, the high price that people pay and the support that Footsteps offered. And I also want to let people know that I am available if your synagogue or your community center is looking for a public speaker. I'm happy to share more of our stories. Uh, reach out to me through Footsteps. Especially on Zoom. It's easy. I love the Zoom format. Everybody's so nice on Zoom. Ellie, what are you watching? Or what are you in next? Or what are you working uh, on? Well, I don't know what I'm in next, but... Um, hopefully you'll get some gigs out of this. Hopefully, hopefully. But I'm, oh, very, I'm very busy reading scripts right now. So we'll see. We'll see. Are you watching anything good, movies, TV? 
Uh, I'm currently binge watching Community. Don't ask me why. No, I just started, my daughter is trying to get me to watch it. And we just had a whole discussion at lunch about it. I'm only through like an episode and a half. What do you think? I'm going to say goodbye. I have to go. Okay, bye, bye Alexa. Thank bye, you. Alexa. Good to see you. I think it's highly bingeable and has some great uh, characters and storylines. But um, um, it's, it's, it's just kind of the perfect thing to watch when you want to forget about everything else. Right. And don't want to think too much. Yeah. All right. Great. I was also been say, for those who speak Hebrew, um, there's a show Autonomiot, which is really, really good. It's in Hebrew. It's about like a hypothetical, like independent Haredi, like ultra orthodox state. It's fast. with no subtitles or has subtitles? I don't think there are subtitles yet. I'm okay. not sure. By the way, for those still with us, I do think we're going to have a Zoom on Fauda coming up. I'm uh, friends with Avi Isakharov and um, spoke to him about doing a Zoom with us. We haven't scheduled it um yet because we're trying to work out the program we won't we don't want it to be the same as the thing he just did um with um leor and dan, dan senior which was great but i just want to do something different so hopefully we'll have a fauda show coming up we also have a show coming up or a zoom whatever this is coming up in a couple of weeks on dating and relationships it will probably not be as much about sex with your clothes on i want to warn you it'll probably be about some other things but it's about dating and relationships in this pandemic and in quarantine all right, I think that we are done. We are over time. Thank you all for your time, for your yeah. questions, for your thoughtful responses, mm -hmm. for your energy. And stay safe, be well, read the foreword, share your stories. Thank you, Jody. Thank, Thank you. you Jody. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank, Thank you, Jody. Thank you, forward. Thank you, Les.